Hello and welcome to another episode of Face to Face. My name is Godfred Akoto Boafo. My guest today has gone through several phases in his life. Student leader, lawyer, budding politician, now full-blown politician. Today he serves as an administrator. He is the chief executive officer of the National Entrepreneurship and Innovation Program. And now he also wants to enter parliament. John Kuma is our guest on Face to Face. John, hello and welcome to Face to Face. Thank you, Godfrey. It's, it's been a while. For, for somebody so young, and I'm using young advisedly, <laughs> your, your name has been in the political landscape for a long time. That is true. How, how did it begin for you? Well, uh, I guess um, uh, I have been a political activist from childhood. Mm. Uh, I remember as early as eight years, I was in a boarding school in Rapid, in Sunyani. And because we were young, we used to have school mothers and school fathers. And as we grew, we became the school mothers and school fathers. I became a school father taking care of other young people. So I eventually became the school prefect. Oh. And then when I went to Pokuare in Kumasi for my secondary education, I became the school prefect again. Okay. And then in university, I became very active with SRC, with NOOCs and eventually became the NOOCs rep on Get Fund, among so many things. So it has become part of me in trying to be part of my society, trying to lead in my community. So that is how come I believe um, I have been very active uh, in politics in Ghana. It's interesting. You mentioned you were born in Sunyai. Yes. So where does the Jesu link come in? Uh, my parents uh, are cocoa farmers. So my dad is the Sanahine of Adangumasi, and my mother is from Ejuso, okay. uh, from the Eduaproche royal family in Ejuso, oh, Odaho. Okay. So, uh, but because they are cocoa farmers, we were in Sankore, in the Hafo region, uh, where, you know, we were into farming. My parents were farmers, both farmers. And then because we were in the village in Sankore, and my dad thought I was bright, he took me to Sunyani to be in boarding school at a very tender age. Oh, okay. So that's how come that's the link. I needed, yes, uh, to, so yes, that's how come I, I entered school very early. And, and pol politics has brought you this far, but at the start, especially at the university level, it wasn't always kind to you. At all. What happened? <laughs> you, you, SRC beat you, nukes beat you. Well, but that, that is the beauty of it uh, in, in life. So I have tasted defeat in politics. I have tasted success and victory in politics. And it has helped to shape in my understanding of life that you can't always win. Sometimes you lose. And when you lose, the essence is not whether you won or you lost, but you kept your presence to be part of the community and still support. At the right time, community will still reward you. But that is, I see, election that... You you lost was quite it's one of the more popular <laughs> races in the history of SRC elections. Uh, exactly. What it, lessons did you glean from um, that loss to Ekpo? Yes, uh, it taught me so many things. Uh, uh, it, and it made me appreciate what politics is all about and what democracy is all about. That you think you are the best, but when the majority of the populace don't understand you, then you are not the best. Mm. So you have to keep explaining your opinion or your policies until you are able to convince the majority. And so you never give up. Even if you are not appreciated now, keep pushing. Because in the end, even those we started with, even though some are still into public you know, service and policies and community issues, some have you know, fell out because maybe uh, they were not really passionate about what they were into. But if, if, if you really knew what you want to achieve, it doesn't matter whether you won or you lost. Okay. But what has always been very common with my engagement is that I'm either winning or almost winning. And that's very important. <laughs> but I'm sure you still keep up with the student politics uh, exactly. face. I, what do you make of the student politics you practiced and the nature of student politics. Now, there are those who say maybe it's now more political than activist when back in the day, you guys fought a lot more yeah, but, for student uh, rights. Yes, but because the circumstances have changed, 
So you cannot also judge them differently. Mm -hmm. We, in most cases, I remember when we, we were entering the University of Ghana in 99, uh, we were under the President Rawlings regime. We sat home as a result of Mobrawa struggle for three weeks. We were actually beaten out of campus and made, the universities were closed down for almost three weeks. And at the end, we had to lose one whole academic year. So you finish secondary school, you have to stay home for two years. So the dynamism of the, um, the political environment at the time has changed. Now it's democracy. The governments are listening to you and, and, and they are prepared to engage on your issue. So it doesn't offer the kind of radical kind of uh, student leadership and activism, activism that is required under political uh, a military regime. To, you know. So definitely I don't see much difference in terms of the drive and passion for st of, of student activism in the country is still there, except that circumstances have changed. If you observe what happened recently in Katanga Hall, mm. when the university tried to change one hall into a miss hall, and the response from the students, it should tell you that the potential to be radical is still there, but it's being managed because of the democratic environment that we have. But, but in your time, I recall, you guys were guys who were always in the courtroom. You were in court more than in the classrooms. <laughs> Being radical was not about destroying school property. It was about facing the authorities oh, in yes. courts of law. Yes. Some of you became very famous simply by suing the university on a daily basis. And most of the time you won. Yes, uh, but that is what is called change in society. You have to go through the legal processes and legal procedure to achieve the change because uh, without change, society cannot move on. And I'm saying that I still see that option available for students. But if there are no uh, course of action, if there, there, there is no need to go and fight in court, the, the person you are fighting says, I agree. Why do you have to go to court? So the, the, there's, there's a lot of changes in the democratic environment now, which may not create that kind of course of action which will push student leaders to go to the extent that some of us went. But when I meet them, I still engage a lot with students at various levels. News, um, USAG, uh, every level of uh, student activists, uh, SRCs across the country. And uh, I can tell you, it's still very passionate and we have very solid student leaders in the system. So let me ask you, what was the attraction to the NPP? Was it that you were born into it or, because I also know at that point, Political parties looked out for the brightest and best from the university political scene to try and recruit. You didn't come from that side, but what was the attraction for you? Uh, well, I think I was actually maybe born into the mm. NPP tradition. And I remember in school, uh, sometimes, mm. when I contested news president, can you believe that the NPP candidate officially sponsored was Dr. Omane Buama? Mm against me. <laughs> <laughs> How times have changed. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, uh, but when you are born NPP, you are NPP. And uh, I've always believed in the freedom of enterprise. I've always believed in um, individual opportunity to free markets and to be able to acquire uh, you know, self-property and build a democratic society. So I am not much of a socialist. I remember when we were in school, our socialist friends like Dr. Mane Buama used to give us books on uh, Che Guevara and the rest. They believed in those uh, systems, even though they were the official candidates of the NPP at the time. It was funny. <laughs> but I have always been, my friends would tell you, I've always believed in the traditions of the NPP. Oh, okay. L l let's segue into where you actually work now, the National Entrepreneurship and Innovation Program. What's the difference between what you do, NYA, YEA, all the EA, <laughs> Aren't you the same? No, vast difference. Vast difference. What do you do? Okay, so the NYA, which is the National Youth Authority, is the overall authority for youth uh, policy in the country. Why it is specifically on youth employment agency and it, it deals specifically on temporary job creation opportunities for young people, maybe up to maximum of three years, you have to exit. But the National Entrepreneurship and Innovation Program targets sustainable job creation in the private sector. They are mm. totally different. And it, it, it's like you want to create jobs in the long term 
and you have to prepare young people to take up the challenge and create the enabling environment for them to be able to be successful. So they, they are totally different areas of focus, even though in the end is one government, it works like a car. Every part of it is very important mm. in order to achieve smooth running of the machine. So we are similar, we complement each other's role, but we are not the same. So what are some of the models that you run? Because I know all of you have models and perhaps that is where the confusion is. What, is, what are your models? Well, I won't say models. We run solely on entrepreneurship. We focus on the entrepreneurship ecosystem and how we can create the necessary enabling environment for startups to thrive in, in Ghana. Mm. And that can be done on a number of pillars. For instance, you have to be able to ensure access to funding. And in line with that, you know His Excellency created, His Excellency Nana Adodanko Ekufuadu created a $100 million entrepreneurship fund under the NEIP program to encourage young people to have access after the requisite training and competence to have access to funding. We also concentrate on access to market. So when we have trained you and we have funded, we want to make sure that your service or your product that you have created is able to be marketed. And now the good news is that Ghana is the trade hub of the Africa Intercontinental Free Trade Area. So it means that we are not even looking at just the Ghana market, the 31 million population. We are looking at the 1.2 billion population of the African continent and beyond. So access to market is very critical. Mm -hmm. Another important thing is the environment, the political environment for startups. So since 2017, um, the government has introduced uh, the tax holidays for young people and young startups in the country up to five years. Really? Yes. So, I mean, if you are an entrepreneur or a young business in this country, you can apply for tax holiday up to five years. The essence is to encourage you to reinvest your possible tax uh, obligations into your business so that you can expand and, and grow. But after the five years, we believe that you would have grown enough to be able to even pay higher taxes than government would have demanded from you in your early stages. So what is the relationship between what you do and what the Business Development Ministry does? We are an implementing agency under the Ministry of Business Development. Mm -hmm. So we are the so children. All that they do, you they, yes, push they, it out. They implement, yeah, we implement their policy as a ministry. Oh, okay. Yes. Interesting. And Dr. Alhaji Mohammed Awal Ibrahim is my minister. Oh, okay. So how do people apply? Because you spoke about you have the funding and whatnot. Yes. How do people apply to get onto your programs? Yeah, it's very easy. And you only apply through when we have um, periods of windows of opening applications. Uh, and usually it's between January and March. Mm. So we are in the window. We are in the window of opening, even though it's not officially announced yet because mm. uh, we are waiting for the directive from the minister. But we are in the window. I'm sure by March, latest by March, it will be opened. And when it's opened, every individual, every individual with a startup idea or with a mindset to create your own business, you qualify to apply. And when you apply, you automatically get the opportunity to go for training. So in the past two years, we have received 19,000 applications. All the 19,000 business startups have gone through training across the country. Really? Yes. And it's as a result. You can back this up? Oh, yes. We can back this. The first year was 7,000. Last year was 12,000. So 19,000. We have trained them across the country. Trained them in what? In business entrepreneurship, in how to do basic bookkeeping, how to formalize your business. Who facilitates this? Which, so is there a curriculum that yes, you've developed? Yes, we have a developed curriculum for the partners. Which school did that? It's not a school. <laughs> we have to put uh, consultants together to create a standardized curriculum. Mm -hmm. And we work in partnership with private hubs. So it's not government who does the training. Okay. We use uh, incubation centers, university campuses, and private hubs to come together as our partners. Okay. So when we receive applications from the public, we post them to these various centers, the incubation hubs and centers and university campuses, whom we have agreed on a standard curriculum to use. Okay. So they then take these uh, trainees 
through the various models. And it's at that level that they put your business concept into scrutiny. They assess the innovativeness of it, the opportunity to create jobs, the scalability, uh, what is the impact. And then at the end of the training, they are required to select best 10 business ideas from all these various centers. And these selected ideas then receive funding from the NEIP fund. And so far, we have funded up to 4,350 businesses. 4,350 businesses, businesses. With a minimum of 10,000 cities and a maximum of 100,000 Ghana cities. Is there a company that has received 100,000? So, oh, yes, so many of them. Okay, we'll get to that in a bit. But staying on the application process, how so the hubs do the selection? Yes, the hubs it is, it has recommend to, to government. No, the, the hubs will select the best 10 businesses. Then the NEIP office will go for due diligence to confirm, because we also have a monitoring evaluation department. Mm. So they will also have to go and confirm what the hubs have done, the private recommendations that have come. So when we are convinced about the business viability, the location, the impact and possibility of job creation and all that, then we release funds. Because I, I'm trying to push on this because there's a perception sometimes yes. that an organization like yours is used as sort of a slash fund stroke, foot soldier, party supporters, party loyalist employment line. So that's true. It, it's a show your party card and get, em, get <laughs> in kind of thing. Yeah, so that is why we have design model which doesn't bring in any political process. So you, first of all, your application, I don't have to see you or know you. So you apply online. And when you apply it, I don't have to see you. You are posted to a private hub. Okay. Now it is the hub, that is where you have to prove your merit. And that place is no government there. It's a private institution. They are qualified consultants for that matter. So they will assess the viability of your business idea and recommend you. So I only get to see the recommended list. Okay. And then we will then go and do due diligence on the recommended list. That is where the problems lie. Well, once you have made it to the top 10, in most cases, you receive the funding. All we are doing is just confirmation. Mm. We are not going to take you out. The due diligence is not to do another selection. It's to confirm what has been given to us. So once you make it at the hub level, I don't have control. Over. Unless we go to check and you are not who the hub says you are, that one we will not release. It, it, have you done this on a national scale where of the 4,350 people you say have successfully received some form of funding? Yes. It's national Across the country, yes. All the 16 regions of Ghana. And how do you do monitoring of these businesses after they go on? Do you do an impact assessment? Exactly. Results? So we have a monitoring and evaluation department who do... And when we give you the funding, it's not the end. You have to have a continuous, three years continuous mentoring arrangement with the program and we continuously monitor you with the support of the hubs that train you so the same hub recommended you for support through them we are able to reach you from our m and e department to be able and we also have software that we give them for free OSE software and accounting software that assist them to follow the, to track their revenues and expenditures and repayment because mm -hmm. these funds are not free these are public funds we need to sustain the program it's repayable loans that we give, um, but of course at 10% per annum, very, very okay. minimal. Two reasons why we have to make it a loan. First of all, we need to sustain the program. We don't want to go back to His Excellency the President after four years, five years, and say that the $100 million is exhausted. So we need to grow that fund. So you need to repay. Secondly, all are over- Are people repaying? Yes, yes. We have, last year we had up to 70% repayment uh, rate. Oh, okay. So because of the continuous mentoring and, and, and business advisory services we give after the funding. And the next important reason why they have to pay is that we know that all over the world, no businessman works with their pocket money. You have to borrow. You have to learn how to borrow money, work with it, and repay. So we want to create that culture in the young people that we support that. Learn how to borrow money, this time at a very minimal rate. But then when you are able to repay, it gives you the confidence that you can now go into any commercial bank or any commercial arrangement, borrow money, and then grow your business. I'm, I, I, am, I am pleasantly surprised that you have <laughs> a 70% debt oh, yes, recovery, recovery rate in your institution. So can you share some of the success stories? And by this, I don't mean general. Can you yes. point them out? We have so many. In fact, when you go to our website, we have uploaded video documentaries 
if you go to www.neip.gov or even our Facebook page, mm. NEIP, a National Entrepreneurial Innovation Program page on Facebook, there are countless individual entrepreneurs and startups in Ghana who have received funding, have increased their capacity to employ more people, and the evidence is, well, I mean, nationwide. Because 4,350 is a significant economic push. Exactly, and you that know. is the objective. And yeah, but I'm just saying the impact sh should be a bit more resounding, should it not? Well, it is. And if you look at what... I don't have to go to a website to feel it if it's resounding. Well, the individual... If you open your phone lines now, you'll be surprised how many testimonies you receive from individuals who have either gone through training or received funding from the program. And this is done, I mean, nationally uh, across the country. And there are lots of testimonies to the effect that uh, people have received the support. Mm. And we continue to give more. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you are watching Face to Face <laughs> with the NEIP CEO, John Kuma. We will also be discussing uh, uh, quite a bit about his political ambitions in the Ejiso constituency. All this and more coming up on Face to Face. Welcome back to Face to Face, chatting with NEIP boss John Kuma on a wide variety of topics. So, John, we've spoken about the NEP and the processes and what you've described a, a situation that seems to be fairly successful. Yeah. Only the listeners can judge from yeah. where they are and those who've benefited. But I also see you've been investor chasing. You have $100 million. Yes. Why are you investor chasing? Well, the idea is to grow the fund. And the idea is to grow the entrepreneurs beyond the 100,000 support that we give. Uh, and so, yes, we've been around. It's one of our mandates to grow the funds. In fact, uh, and so far, it looks very positive. The World Bank, too, under the uh, special arrangement with the um, government of Ghana, is also supporting this year with uh, some extra funding. Uh, so it looks good. The, 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 the idea is to help push these startups beyond the, the, the startup level, to scale them up mm. with extra funding that can help them to become more competitive. I, I have a message from somebody who says your advisory services are not really the best. You touted it, but he says your advisory services need help. We, we are happy to welcome his help because that's the essence of uh, improvement. What, what, kind of, what, what is the nature of the advisory services you provide? We, we don't give direct, we as government don't give business advisory services, but we pay the private hubs to deliver it and consultants to deliver on our behalf. So you monitor the advisory services? Yes, we do. That, I told you we have an M&E department that goes Maybe they're not giving you the right feedback. This uh, beneficiary who says your advisory services okay. need improving. So if he can give us the feedback, we welcome it and see how we can make it better. Mm. Mm. And what is the plan going forward for the NEIP? Certainly you have a vision of moving this forward to the next level. Exactly. What is it? This year we want to do more than doing an online application. So we want to focus on the district assemblies across the country. So instead of doing an online portal applications, we will write to the district assemblies, the MCEs and possibly the members of parliament in those districts to recommend maybe 50 to 100 startups or businesses in their community. Then we will send the trainers there to engage them directly and then recommend to us the best innovation ideas that they can select for us to put funds in. Let's talk a bit of politics now, considering what the space also that you work in. The youth of this country, the young people here, do you think the NPP has done well for them? Extremely well. Extremely well. What are your benchmarks? The, well, the, all the benchmark points to the right direction. I mean, the number one concern for young people in this country is jobs. Mm. And you see, the NPP promised them a manifesto, an agenda for job creation manifesto in 2016. And if you check, even the rates of unemployment has dropped from 15% to 
to the latest figure of 7.3 percent. According to whose numbers, John? Well, according to the Ministry of Labor and Employment, they control official figures. Well, and those the, numbers we, we, we the, refuse to the, buy. And the statistics, uh, statistical service of Ghana, because they use the same data. So that is according to the statistical service data of Ghana. If it is wrong, if these official data are wrong, then I'm wrong. No, but there's a difficulty there because up until last year, we did not, up until 2018, no minister or the statistical service or the employment ministry could provide data numbers. So out of the blue, if somebody now starts they telling me numbers... Now they can. We are not saying I'm that saying, we should be stuck. What was the benchmark? Well, if nobody has actually been able to question it. It's been over a year since these figures came. Oh, we've been questioning. Nobody wants you to respond. You only question rather. with your mouth. <laughs> I haven't seen to any work done to counter it. So as for criticism, you're allowed and everybody else is allowed. But let's work with the official data. Okay, you go on. And across the country, I mean, if you look at the various interventions of government, from planting for food and jobs to one district, one factory, to... Stop at the one district, one factory. Okay. Is it employing people? Yes, it is. As we speak, we have about 55 that is currently running. And assuming each of them has even employees of 50 people, multiply that. So, yes, we are confident about the job creation we talk about. Mm. And clearly... It's every... not a figment of people's imagination. No, no. Our kind of job creation is not in the green book. This is the kind of job creation people can testify that, yes, in my community, I have seen a toilet roll factory being set up in Insawam uh, prisons. If I live in Insawam, I have seen it. There's a tomato factory, uh, maybe in Wenchi, I have seen it. If you go to Ada, Sege area, so many steel factories, a whole lot of factories that have been commissioned by His Excellency Danado Danko Kufuado. And Ghanaians attest to these things. So, and then what even makes it very beautiful is that they are private sector led. It's not like government goes to put up a factory and one year later we are told we didn't even have the, <laughs> the uh, sugar cane to, to supply to a factory that we have built to produce sugar. This kind of uh, ill arrangements is what made the Ghanaian economy suffer in the past. And that is not what we are doing now. We know about the problem of doing so and how that alone caused a lot of unemployment in the country. Mm. You know it. And now we don't hear about doing so again. So once the environment has improved and the stability in the system, automatically, FM stations that, and TV stations that were closing at midnight can now do 24 hours. That means more hands. So clearly, all the evidence is clear that government has indeed improved the environment for job creation. Young people are being encouraged. Even whilst they are in school. One of the initiatives my office is doing in collaboration with National Service Secretariat is to encourage students whilst they are in school to start their businesses so that during the National Service period of one year, when they are posted to various places to do their National Service, they'll be posted under the NEIP program and they'll be required to be on their own project, their okay. own business that they have started for that one year whilst they receive the National Service Allowance. Interesting. After that, they will continue to apply for further funding from the NEIP program. And then we are able to create new jobs and new ideas into the system and help it to expand. So, I mean, everybody can attest to what is going on that indeed, there are a lot of difference. I mean, go every sector, teachers, <laughs> we know. Picketing all the time. On what? Everything. What, no, what don't teachers pick it on? Well, but we are, they are not picketing or not being posted. Well, there's a few uh -huh. of those. So, well, if there is a few, if you compare the numbers mm -hmm. in just three years ago and what it is now, you can attest to the fact that indeed, after we have restored their training allowances, plus the nurses and everything, we have increased the numbers. I mean, double track alone but you, recruited you, on over 8,000. John, you, yes. you gave allowances, but there are no jobs. The nurses... Some of them are even in court because they, they said they went to pick it. Yes, that is illegal. But there are no jobs. Yes, but they complain that they've been sitting home from 2013. But that is not the doing of this government. We are only trying to solve it. And well, you are the that, government. We don't yeah, care where you came well, from. Well, but they also know the difference between this government and the previous government, even though it's one government. And they know that at least in the past year or two, about 54,000 of them have been recruited. Maybe out of 200,000. So there will still be a, more people who complain. Recruited but, and posted where? In various hospitals. In this country? Yes. Go and check the data. It is there. So the problem is that they've been home for With too long. With the poor 
uh, nurse to patient ratio that we have, we put in 54,000 and yes. that ratio hasn't gone up? Well, it is better than previously. I will not say it is the best. And what I'm saying is that if you have 100,000 backlog and you post 50,000, we are not saying we have posted everybody. Mm -hmm. What we are saying is that, I mean, before we were under IMF and you, even public sector employment were seized. Now, within two years, His Excellency Danado Danko Ekufuado was able to take Ghana out of the IMF pro, uh, conditionalities. And now we have the opportunity to do public sector employment. So all these opportunities have come up for young people to be engaged better than before. We are not saying, under no shred of circumstance, saying that we have solved all unemployment issues in Ghana. I just told you yeah. the rate has dropped to 7.3. That means that 7.3 of capable young people in this country cannot find jobs, even if they want to. So we still acknowledge that there are problems. But the good news is that it used to be 15, it's now 7. So there are efforts, commendable efforts, which if we sustain and help, we can see bigger improvements to reduce to barely minimal levels. So that's all that we are saying that indeed, this government is making lots of strides for young people in this country. There's hope compared to yesterday, but we can still do better looking at our circumstances. And that is what I encourage young people that the various opportunities that come I mean, NAPCO alone gave 100,000 jobs immediately to young people. Mm. Yes. So, you put out this NAPCO a lot. Yes, but that is a fact. I mean, if you are graduating, you have sat home for four years after your national service. Mm -hmm. You have no idea the stress. It, but go and talk to those who got the opportunity under, under NAPCO. At least at the end of the month, they have new experience. They have some small salary coming in. They, they, they now can breathe of hope. Let me ask you something. What is, is there a link between what you do yeah. and NAPCO? Because I realized Definitely. that you do offer training for those under the YEA program. As soon as you are in there, you are allowed training. These NAPCO people, do they get training under your model? So it's a partnership arrangement that we do. We just signed an MOU with YEA. Mm -hmm. So obviously under NAPCO too, we have another training arrangement. Mm -hmm. to train those who want to like the enterprise Ghana, mm -hmm. those who want to go on to their own businesses after the period of support. We train them, we work together closely where necessary to train them and to give them some of the startup capital, those who qualify. It's not automatic. If you are able to convince us of an innovative business you want to start and we do the assessment and you qualify, we give you the funding. So we, I, uh, let me stop you there okay. a bit. Innovative business. Yes. Like, that's why I asked you who determines the hubs, the consultants. Know, who picks this? Because in this day and age, an idea might, might sound bad right now. It, dep that's what it depends on who is doing the judging. Yeah. An idea might sound bad now, but might be worth billions of dollars in two years. Yes, that idea cannot die, even if it's not supported by us. I've always told young people who come for competition that the fact that you are not selected is not the end of your progress. So look to sustain your vision. You believe in it, but I don't at this point. But you need to convince everybody why you should be believed in tomorrow. So it, it, the fact that somebody has been selected above you today doesn't mean that tomorrow yours will not be preferred. So that one, we don't begrudge it. And we allow professionals who are, you know, the presumption is that have the requisite skill and determination to make about who must be assisted based on the criteria. So on that score, I will not go in to say this one was better than the other. In so, fact, so. we hear that complaint all the time. But for me, I tell people that if you believe in your ideas and you think they are good, your being selected or not is never a barrier. In any case, how much support are you getting? Okay. You need more than that to be successful. All right. Let me ask you a final question on this so that we can go into Ejesu and what is about <laughs> to happen <laughs> in Ejesu. This is a country that is dominated by young people, yeah. if you look at our demographics. Sitting where you sit, is the MPP meeting the aspirations genuinely yeah. of the young people in this country who can look today at Danko Kufado and say, this is a president who thinks like me, who knows what I believe in. Who knows where I want to go? And it's running, a, it's building a country where I can thrive in and compete with the best of the world. Not the best of the NDC, the best of the world. Yes. And I mean, Ghanaians, Ghanaian youth 
and let me say I'm part of the Ghanaian youth, mm. we have seen a youthful president under President Mahama and the lack of hope and the hopeless situation he created for us. And we have seen a more older president in president, Nanado Dankwe Kufuado, and the hope and his focus on the youth agenda. We have seen it clearly. And I mean, what even motivates young people like me about His Excellency the President is more of his vision about where he wants to place our country mm -hmm. in the Committee of Nations. And I'm always proud anytime President Anaku Fuado is out there and we are talking about Ghana. This is a president who says that he wants to build Ghana beyond aid and has created a vision that even the United Nations have adopted that slogan for the entire continent of Africa. And he has pushed to bring the Intercontinental Free Trade Area Agreement to be headquartered in Ghana. So he's not thinking about today, he's thinking about tomorrow okay. and how to lift the young people of this country to be in charge of the affairs of the world, especially on the continent of Africa. So yes, if you are talking about leadership, providing hope and future for young people of Ghana, then obviously, his Excellency Nanado Danko Kufuado has done a yeoman's job. All right. And it's up to young people, you and I, to take advantage of the opportunities that he has offered us. I mean, I didn't talk about year of return and the many benefits that brought to us as a people and the opportunities for young people to tap into. Did you watch the Rick, Rick, Rick Ross, or what's the name? Yes, Rick Ross. When he came to Ghana, a young Ghanaian. Yes, yeah, CJ Pegama. Uh, thank you. Got opportunity to be linked up and they become friends. Who knows tomorrow? So clearly, what every step of the way by this government is clearly opening doors and opportunities for young people who are ready and prepared to take advantage of. All right, then we'll take another break on Face to Face when we return at Jiso and the Battle Ahead. <laughs> Welcome back to Face to Face, We're speaking to John Kuma. John, you've described for the past 40 minutes, you've described a very satisfactory job that you have, where you feel you are contributing to the country. You are touching the lives of the people of the future. And then we hear you want to give it all up to go to parliament, <laughs> to make laws. You don't want to touch our lives anymore. Why? Well, uh, there are levels of touch that you can give based on your levels of authority. Mm. I think that if I become a member of parliament, I'll be in a position to do more of the touch and become much more influential than where I am now. So, yes, I mean, I am already doing something, mm -hmm. but that something is... Something profound. Yes, something profound as a CEO. Uh, as a CEO, you can only implement you are not allowed to formulate any policy. But maybe I have a capacity to formulate policy that can also add to the speed that we are going. So becoming a member of parliament gives me a better and higher platform to do more than what I'm doing now. So it's not to leave it, but to add to it. I, I need to ask, did the young people in the MPP meet and have a meeting and say, we are all going to parliament, especially those of you in government? Yes. Virtually everybody in government wants to be an MP. Why? Well, what is there? none of us two is contesting for the first time. Mm. I contested previously mm -hmm. uh, in the last uh, primaries. Almost all the CEOs that you are talk talking about, uh, I mean, Stephen Amwa contested before, uh, um, Free Zones, uh, Mr. Uh, Ochebefi contested before. Uh, Nakabos says he's going. Nakabos has. Prezama. Uh, well, Prezama was the assemblyman before, but. Mm -hmm. uh, because he was outside, uh, maybe this will be his first time. Mm. And, uh, and Wale Wale, we have the deputy uh, Northern Development Authority boss having I, a go. Yes, I think he has contested before. So almost all the names that you can think of, Anyas of uh, Napco contested before. He was actually a parliamentary candidate. Mm -hmm. So uh, <laughs> we have already we are already been part of the process, and it's nothing new that. Uh, we want to have why opportunity you, why, why, why to Why do you serve? want to remove Mr. Uswe Domi? He's, uh, he's done well for the yes. people of Ejusu. Yes. To uh, do more for it, the people of Ejusu. <laughs> well, you know, why he are you came... Better? Yes, uh, he came to remove um, Honorable Akwesi Oseji yes. when he was the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Mm, quite a feat. And, and, yes, and then according to him, uh, Honorable Oseji has done three years, three terms, and it was time for fresh blood and new direction to come. 
which the Ajusu people gave him the opportunity. We have also seen what he has done. I mean, he's proven to be a competent engineer. He's helped Ghana in so many ways, especially in roles. But there's a new fresh blood on the block. He's a lawyer, very energetic, <laughs> very Your dynamic. Your body don't <laughs> <laughs> What are you going to <laughs> What exactly he, do you bring to the table? I mean, obviously, a new drive, a new dynamism to push the development agenda of Ejusu. So clearly, we, I mean, it is time to also give the youth opportunity to also be part of decision making in the country. And I think that I offer that new hope, that new direction that we need to have in our politics. We need, we need some changes and that will happen if I get the opportunity. What, 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 for those who don't know Ejusu, what is the makeup of the people? What kind of people are they that makes you feel you are the one that can move them forward? What do they do? Okay, so Ejusu is uh, very close to Kumasi. Mm -hmm. So it's like the entry point of the Ashanti region. Mm -hmm. It's a very cosmopolitan, uh, made up of farmers. I mean, the, beyond Ejusu, there are a number of other smaller towns and communities whose major vocation is farming. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's also very close to the city because of its strategic location you have a number of you know middle class um, Ghanaians living there it's also a traditional town you know if you look at the Ashanti traditions and culture tradition means a lot to us as a people and you know is the home of Yasantua the famous you know legendary woman who led the Yasantua war so we we and then we also have Bonyure the home of kente and you know now kente is one of the key uh, products that as a country when it comes to tourism we can really take advantage of so we have a number of economic um, opportunities and prospects and tourist uh, potential tourism development uh, issues in it so uh, we have a lot of young people especially when it comes to football the, mm. the, the youth like football a lot in it so it's also an opportunity to grow more talent uh, to feed into our black stars and various national teams. So, uh, like I tell you, like uh, just so like any other um, uh, big city in Ashanti region, the the youth are looking up for opportunities, economic opportunities, job creation. How many of them? I mean, I can say that the level of education among young people in Ejuso is quite high. Okay. And, uh, we, I mean, therefore, we must have an agenda to create jobs for all these young people who are coming out of various institutions and to give them the hope that they can stay within their community and still make a difference. So these are a number of other things that we need to do to place Ejusu properly on the map. And since it's also the entry into Ashanti region, you should be able to feel Ejusu better as a test of entering Kumasi, okay. you know, and then we must have a broader um, policy or an agenda to, to make you feel Ashanti region when you are entering Kumasi through Ejusu. And all these things will not come without a policy and, and direction. And we, I hope that when I get the opportunity, I will be one of the people who will contribute to change the story. I mean, we used to hear about Kumasi being the garden city. Now when you go there, you may not have that picture about Kumasi. Mm -hmm. What can we do to bring back those glorious days back? And it requires of us to have a systematic direction, a, a vision that can lift the image of Ejusu and Kumasi together. So come April 20, 2020, 25th, you are certain that you are going to... I'm very certain that I'm going to win the, the primaries. Listen to your message. Uh, and yes, say and I'm a delegate man. myself. You know, I'm very close to the delegates in Ejusu. I'm also an electoral area coordinator for uh, one Transi Ebrem in Onye. Ejusu has a lot of delegates. 750. Yes, 750. And I'm one of them. <laughs> so, <laughs> so when it should it, be interesting. Yes, it's very interesting. And, and because I'm very close to them, they know I understand the issues better. They know I appreciate what concerns them. And they also believe in me that even before that I become the member of parliament, they know my contribution in the area and what I can do to help to change the political dynamics of the area.
right then. We wish you well Thank in you. that endeavor and also in your endeavor as CEO Thank of you. the National Entrepreneurship and Innovation Program. Thank you. Uh, it's been interesting speaking to John Kuman. <laughs> For those of you who have questions surrounding the NEIP, I know it's a conversation yeah. that is important to a lot of people. I hope he's been able to explain. And uh, come March, hopefully, when the official announcement comes, those of you who want to apply will look back at this interview and find ways yeah. of applying and doing and, and finding success in that particular model. My name is Godfrey Akotobuafu. It's been a pleasure coming your way. Have a good day.